everybody. I have with me here today, Mary Gentili. She is the creator and the director of Giving Voice to Values, which is a fabulous book, by the way, and an approach to ethics. She's also a professor of practice at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Cindy. I'm really glad to have you here. She, her areas of focus, let me tell you just a little bit about Mary and then we'll dive into the conversation here. Her areas of focus are strategy and ethics and entrepreneurship and leadership. She's also a senior advisor at the Aspen Institute Business and Society Program. Mary's written a host of books and articles and won many awards for being an influential leader in business ethics. So we are super excited to have you here today. Thank you. You're welcome. We are going to be talking about, um, like I said, the Harvard Business Review article that was written about 25 years ago by um, a guy named Andy Stark. Uh, and he was talking then about what he saw as um, some of the problems with teaching business ethics, which was a fairly new um, topic to be taught in business schools then. And what we're going to talk about is how, what has changed in the last 25 years? How has the approach changed, if at all? Do we think it's improved? And what do we think is the path forward for the next 25 years? So let me just start by asking you what your thoughts were on um, Andy's Harvard Review, uh, Harvard Business Review article. When he was mentioning then that the approach he thought to business ethics was too impractical and too theoretical and too general. Did that strike a chord for you at least back then? And is it still the case today? Getting to Andy's article, you know, there's so much in his article that I resonated with and that I agreed with, and some of which is still true. Um, but there are some places where I would um, diverge a bit. Um, you know, he, I think he's right that, in, and I know he's right, actually, that initially the way we tried to talk about ethics, and I was part of this, you know, I'm not criticizing the world here. The right. way we tried to talk about ethics in business schools was um, to bring in philosophy, and philosophy is hugely valuable and provides many, many insights, but we weren't able to present it, share it, package it, deliver it in a way that was always um, accessible, um, uh, clear, useful for our students. The other thing that it did is that the traditional business school faculty um, felt like, you know, as any professor would, they felt like they, their value add in the world is their expertise. And if they weren't philosophers, they didn't feel comfortable, you know, teaching philosophy light, you know, it sort of went against their norms as academics, right? So right. you either brought in a philosopher who could talk about it in that way, but then he or she was more likely to frame it for philosophy students, right. and also didn't have the depth of background in business reality, or you asked business school faculty to integrate it into what they were doing, and they were hugely uncomfortable because this wasn't their body of knowledge and it seemed like it was a distraction from what they were teaching and they didn't know how to bring the two together. So for all those reasons, I agree with Andy that that was a challenge. It was part of making it too theoretical, not practical enough. He also talks about it being too general and what he means there I think is that often business ethicists did a kind of critique of the capitalist system writ large. Mm. And certainly there are many things to criticize about the capitalist system writ large, but it was very difficult to go from there to what do I do if I'm the internal auditor in a firm and I'm being pressured to cook the books. I mean, they were, they were very exactly. important for yeah. some both levels, but they it was hard to bring them together. Right. So, you know, the way I tend to frame that and the way others tend to frame that is, you know, that we were focusing on uh, what I call the two A's, awareness and analysis. So awareness meant that we, you know, when we got to a more case-based approach, um, that was awareness. We were sharing people examples of all the ways things could go wrong, <laughs> okay? And I can remember talking to an accounting professor who said, you know, sometimes I worry that I'm actually teaching people how to cook the books, <laughs> you know, because we're spending so much time showing the problems, you know, right. and that wasn't what he intended, right? So building awareness, which is important. You want people to know where things could go wrong. Right. Um, 
But and, and, and so, because if you don't get past awareness, right, then you can never get to the other steps. And yes, that's right. Going different. So, if they, so, so they've got to recognize these situations as actually presenting ethics issues. So awareness, exactly. yeah, exactly. Exactly, because, of, you know, the, the comment I would often get from people is, well, students don't even recognize an ethical issue. So I, I think that's partly true, and that's why awareness is important, especially you know, in a world that's increasingly global, where technology is developing, there are issues we, we, that are new to us, right? That we, we didn't grow up with. Right. Uh, I also think the awareness is, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Because a lot of the core ethical issues that we'll end up talking about in, in an ethics class, in a business school, are times when actually you kind of do know this was lying to the customer, this was cooking the books, this was putting an unsafe product through because we were on a time crunch, um, you know, whatever it was. Um, so front loading our reporting, our inventory reporting, that kind of thing, our sales reporting. So awareness is necessary, not sufficient. The other thing we would do is teach analysis. And, and I think Andy talks about this as well. And this is his two theoretical critique uh. where we would bring in the models of ethical reasoning from philosophy. The, uh, the idea behind this was a good one because they wanted to help people think, now that you've recognized the issue, can you think rigorously and consistently about where the lines are and what's right and wrong. Um, in a corporate setting, rather than sharing philosophy, this often meant sharing the code of conduct or the corporate value statement or the relevant laws and regulations. Again, necessary, important, both of these, you know, think rigorously, know where the bright lines are. Right. But then what we would do is we would give someone a case and we'd say, is this over the line or not? And the problem with that is that, um, used poorly, and this was not the intent, but used poorly, it kind of can become a, a schooling for sophistry, you know, where people will begin to say, you know, you know, these models of ethical reasoning, they conflict. It's not like they give you a right answer. They give right, you what right. you think. And so the answers will conflict depending on where you're putting the emphasis. Are you looking at stakeholders or are you looking at duties? You know, right. are you looking at virtues? So, um, you know, so it, it became a helpful way to begin to think and reason, but they didn't tell you what's right. And this is where you get to Andy's third point about it being impractical. They certainly didn't tell you how to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and when you get out in the business world, it's going to be a lot about getting it done. And so how do you right. do that ethically? Yeah, you're right. right. So this is where we move beyond where I think Andy was when he wrote this article. No, no criticism of him. Things have developed. Yeah. Since fortunately. That, fortunately. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Since then, there's been a whole lot more research in psychology, in neurosciences, in behavioral ethics, behavioral economics. And we know a lot more about how people act and why people act and how they react to values conflicts. And so one of the things that we've learned is that um, when people encounter these kinds of tension points, these conflicts, um, it's not like we sit down, and this is human beings, this isn't just business, it's not like we sit down and make a pro and con list right. or think what would John Rawl say and what would Aristotle say? Right. We don't do that. Instead, we tend to react emotionally, yeah. kind of automatically, mm -hmm. um, often even unconsciously, mm -hmm. um, and then we rationalize post hoc why it was the right thing to do or why it was the only thing we could do. Those are the two arguments you get. It was okay right. or I had no choice, right? right. And so um, just helping people think in that way, then that ends up supporting that schooling for sophistry idea, you know, because yeah. you're better at rationalizing after right. the fact. Right. So what I figured we needed to do was to, to create a different kind of pedagogy for the action part, for the what do you do part. Yes. And I think what we really needed to do was not just give people a decision-making framework. That's, that's what sure. people always look for and want. There's a million of them. Right. And it's not that they're useless, they're not enough. Um, and so what, what I decided is we needed a different pedagogical approach. Got so it. we needed to, um, I call it, it's like a post decision making approach. Yeah. So instead of giving someone a scenario and saying, what would you do, Cindy? You know, what's the right thing to do? Um, because if you do that, you'll get three kinds of answers and none of them are helpful. Yeah. <laughs> you'll get the people who will say, well, I would always do the right thing. And they may really mean it, but 
we it know in reality that way they in reality right. won't always do that right right for a lot of reasons right right and then you get the people who would say well i know what you want me to say mary and cindy but in the real world it's just not possible you know you're yeah. being naive right and then you get the people who and they may be just playing devil's advocate but they may just be trying to be honest right and then you get the people who will argue with the premise they'll say well that's not wrong right yeah. Yeah. None of those approaches will get you to where we're trying to go, which is yeah. to prepare values-driven ethical leaders. Yeah. And so what, what I thought needed to happen at that point, and this is what's supported by that new research since Andy's article, yeah. is to actually rewire that automatic connection. Yeah. The automatic connection is because it's what you think is possible, mm -hmm. right? And so if I've actually given you the opportunity to rehearse, to practice, to pre-script, to action plan, to peer coach, to work with my peers who are stand-ins for the kind of people I'd need to work with in the workplace to create solutions that are ethical and effective, then I'm actually, when I'm in that situation, my immediate response, I have, I have more options. I have more arrows in my quiver, right? Because right. I've rehearsed this. I've built right. this new muscle memory, this moral muscle memory. So that's where I think Andy, you know, he was setting the stage. Uh -huh. But this new research, I think, is taking us further. Yeah, I think you're right. So when he set the stage, he thought that the answer going forward um, was moderation, pragmatism, and <laughs> minimalism. What do you think about that? It's what he that. said 25 years ago is what he thought the path forward should be. Do you agree with that? And where, or, or what do you kind of think the path forward is? And where does your approach for action after awareness and analysis turning to action, where does that fit in? So he again yeah. thought it was moderation, pragmatism, and minimalism was the path forward. Yeah. 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 So I had a kind of mixed reaction to his three words. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly all about being practical. You know, I mean, I think this focus on action is nothing if not trying to be practical, trying to give people the, op the skills and the comfort and the confidence and the, the habit right. of acting effectively right. Um, right. on their values. So I, I like that piece, but, but I feel like his um, motivation, partly because he was reacting to all those challenges that we just talked yes. about, his motivation was to sort of narrow the ask you know, um, to make it feel more accessible, to make it form, feel more realistic. So I understand that, but I actually feel like I would come at it slightly differently. I feel that if you focus on what we were just talking about, this sort of um, rehearsal and action and prescripting mm -hmm. and looking for different ways to act, that what you're actually doing is rather, rather than narrowing the ask, you're actually expanding the options. <laughs> so I tend to think about these courses is more um, less about constraints on action, less about thou shalt not, and more about sort of an entrepreneurial approach to ethics. It's sort of like can do, um, more aspirational. It's like, yes. what if you could do this? Right. How could you do this? You know? Right. And then I think people end up start realizing they may have had more options than they thought they did. Yeah. Um, um, when I interview people to develop uh, Giving Voice to Values, the curriculum I've developed, you know, and they would tell me stories about, if these are business people, they'd tell me stories about times when they'd acted on their values effectively. And also they would want to tell me about the times when they failed. They wouldn't want to present themselves as, boy, sure. what a good girl am I, yeah. you know? Yeah. And when I asked them, well, why didn't you when you didn't? Because they clearly were people who cared about it. They would almost always say, because I didn't think I had a choice. Um, and so, although I understand where Andy's coming from, I actually think it's, it's more reactionary. It's more the sense of, oh, well, these faculty and business people are going to say, you can't ask this of me. It's too much to ask. And so he's trying to narrow the ask. I'm sort of saying, let's reframe the ask. So it's somewhere they want to go, yes, <laughs> you yes, know, yes. and where it then actually creates more options. And what I've interestingly found when I go to businesses and not just business school, they like this approach because it's not just about ethics. It's really about leadership. It's about being able to do things right. that you maybe didn't think you could do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, you know, being more effective. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I think about that. It's not, it's like I understand where he's coming from. I was there myself, but I feel like I'm pushing past that. Yeah, you know? got it. So if you were to think about what 
you think your three words are now for moving past the point where we are because you've reframed what so 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 actually you kind of reframed where you think we are today your approach was is being one of them that reframed it and actually broadened it for individuals to think about the fact that they do have a choice they're not trapped right they're not they're not trapped showing them that almost feels empowering and freeing and is a great leadership point so what do you think if i were to ask you are the three words that would <laughs> describe what you think let's call it ethics 3.0 if andy was <laughs> ethics 1.0 where we are today is ethics 2.0 so we've brought it current we've added behavioral ethics we've added you know you're giving voice to values broadening approach for framework what do you think ethics 3.0 is going to be all about and what three words would you use yeah so you're asking an academic to label ideas in one word or three words <laughs> so, <laughs> which is very hard to do I three know. phrases <laughs> <laughs> sure absolutely okay thank you <laughs> So I thought about this a little before we spoke, and I guess I would say I think number one, something we were just talking about is that it's it's about it's about choice. It's about people having more choices than they may have believed they did when they walked right. into the situation. Yep. So it's about acknowledging that we have choice. Right. The second one is um, uh, what I call moral muscle memory. It's uh, you know it's this idea about um, through rehearsal, through practice, through peer coaching, we create this this um, almost automatic sense that we can do this. You know, it's a comfort, it's a confidence, and it's also a set of skills that you can reach for. You know, um, so a moral muscle memory it becomes a, a more automatic response. And I guess the third one is um, you know it's all about asking a new question. Instead of asking what's right, we try to ask, you know, once you know what's right, how do you get it done effectively? So it's not just about being righteous. Andy talks about this in his article about, you know, that some of the philosophers would sort of say, well, if it, if it was something that was that you could do and not suffer for it, it's not ethical. Yes, <laughs> you know? right, right, and right. I, I don't really approach it that yeah, way. Yeah, I know. That's that's like yeah. an either or, it, like the yeah. world can't exist the way it is today. I mean, it, yeah. you're never going to win that sort of, you're it's never going to convince hard. people. It, you it's can't win. Hard. That isn't a reality you can live in. Yeah, yeah. And so I think instead of asking what's right, it's an important question, of course. I'm not saying don't worry about that. But we do that already. I think the question is, once you know what's right, how do you get it done effectively? Yeah. It's really, it's really a key one. Yeah. So those would be my sort of three phrases. I hope Got that's... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So thank you for that. And I, I think that that is um, actually kind of leads right into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, because those, those three choices um, and phrases, or I'm sorry, those three phrases, one of them being choice, um, do speak to leadership, I would say, on a personal level and freeing the mind to think about, well, how would you do it? Because you do know what is right. If you take that to the corporate level, I, I'm wondering if um, you see any corollary there with like what the business roundtable just mm. came out with um, late last year on changing what they see as the main purpose of a corporation, which is according to them and what they've 181 CEOs signed on to is no longer just to serve the shareholder, but to actually serve and balance the needs of all of the um, uh, different stakeholders, including specifically called out dealing ethically with your suppliers. Mm -hmm. So do you, I want your, I'd like to have your reaction to that statement and what, do you see a connection to what your approach is on sort of the personal level to maybe what this group of CEOs is trying to say for corporations? Right, right. So um, I'll start by saying, I think it was a good thing that they did that, you know, just like the letter from BlackRock was a good thing. Yep. Um, you know, I, I think it, 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 what's useful about it is it becomes reinforcing. It becomes something that those practitioners and executives and managers, as well as academics who are trying to talk about these issues can point to and can say, you know, leading figures in the professional and practical world of business are recognizing that this is important. Yes. The other thing that I'll say is that it's not new. Yeah. I <laughs> you agree. know that many people have been talking about this for a long time, including business professionals. Yes. It hasn't been something that an organization like the Roundtable has signed on to, which I think is huge because they've been uncomfortable doing that because of 
uh, pressures for shareholder value maximization and all of those kinds of things. Um, it's a little bit like, look at what's going on right now with racial justice, you know? Right. A lot of people are coming out and saying, we, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, sports organizations are coming out and saying, you know, we support racial justice, we want Black Lives Matter, all of these things. And some of them are actually really putting some effort and, and visible things behind that. Right. And some are not. You right. Know? Yeah. And so, you know, but on balance, I think it's a fabulous thing to have out there because it's something you can use when you're communicating to students, you know, uh, for years we were stuck with the Milton Friedman article about, you know, the social responsibility of business is, is profit, you know, and so it's nice to, and we were always looking for the succinct, compelling argument on the other side. It's nice to have that. Um, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, sometimes there's real power in memorializing and writing down what many companies were say in this example doing anyway okay that that's great but memorializing it and writing it down so it is there on paper so that you know it's sort yeah. of like writing your goals for you know the exactly. month and the year on a piece of paper and putting it right in front of you so you can hold yourself accountable right. uh, but on the other hand it the proof is in the pudding it's like right. you know right. Like everything, you know, yeah. it's like a company having a beautiful state, you know, remember Enron, everyone made the jokes about their, their code of conduct, which That's was right. an award-winning right. code of ethics, and then, That's right. you know, there were problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you like get one point for writing it down, but you get, you know, nine points for actually executing against Execution. it. Execution. So you want a perfect <laughs> 10, but you've got to have that guiding light so you know what you need to execute against. Yeah. Um, so I think it probably is, is helpful in that regard, even if... Yeah. if people were executing yeah. against it. Well, this has been great. I'm going to ask you three fun questions okay. that um, I like to ask uh, everyone that I talk to. Uh, and it's great resources too for folks. But what's the best book that you've read in the last few months? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, and most of the books I read are books for a book series that I edit. So I didn't really want to necessarily just plug one of those. <laughs> So I started, I thought in the last, it was probably the last five months, so I hope that's okay. Sure. But I read um, uh, Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny, 20, 20 Lessons for the 21st Century. Oh. And, you know, he's a historian at Yale, and he's a historian who studies populism. Um, um, he's done a lot of work on um, the, the Holocaust and Nazis and uh, World War II Germany. But he's also looked at populism more globally. He's a really smart, interesting guy. But this book is very readable. It's 20 things to think about if you're kind of worried about the direction that your nation or your world is going in. Um, and one of his lessons, I think it might be the first or second, is something where he talks about avoiding anticipatory obedience. And that's the one that really I, resonated for me regarding the things we're talking about. Right. Because what he talks about is that in a historical context, when there were authoritarian regimes coming into power who were perhaps doing some things that were not so great, yes. um, that people would, um, not that they supported the direction that things were going in, they needed to go there somehow. They felt like they didn't have those choices. And he was pointing out that historically speaking, that actually made things worse and it made things worse faster. And I thought that was a really interesting analogy with what you sometimes see in corporations because when I interview people who are lower in the organization and even senior people who are talking about pressures from the market right they will often curtail their sense of their options and and in anticipate anticipation sort of be obedient to some sort of imagined mm -hmm. and and real but imagining the pressure sooner and greater than it may actually be Isn't so I, I thought that was yeah. relevant so it's give a us great the, book. <laughs> it's a great, so give us the name and the author again. Yes, it's audience. called On Tyranny. And then oh, the tyranny. subtitle is 20 Lessons for the 21st Century. It's just a small little book and uh, written by Timothy Snyder, who's a, a professor at Yale. Great. That sounds like a wonderful recommendation for all of us at yeah. this point in time. Yeah. So what about a best, your, your favorite movie or video series that you've, that you've watched lately? A lot of us are spending more time at home. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about that and I was thinking, well, 
<laughs> so I had two answers. <laughs> I'm thinking, I, I haven't been actually watching a lot of TV or, or movies. I've been watching, and this is probably a mistake, but I've been watching the news <laughs> yes. over and over and different channels and different network takes of it. Sure. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's challenging, but it's filled with, with ethical issues, right? Um, and some of the biggest ones are, you know, what to do in response to things that you're seeing and reading. When I tried to think about something maybe a little lighter, I, I, I remembered um, a few months ago, I, I watched a series, I sort of binge watched, a, it was a series that is older, but I had never seen it called Lie to Me. <laughs> I don't oh, know if you've ever seen this. Yeah. And it's about a guy who runs a business that he's supposed to be very good at detecting when people are being deceptive. Ah. And so, um, and so it raises issues like concepts of radical honesty. And it also, you know, talks about, well, how honest do you have to be when you're trying to catch someone who's being dishonest? And there's a lot of ethical issues floating around in it. Plus it's just really entertaining. Yeah. What about a good podcast you've listened to uh, lately? Yeah. Yeah. The one I, I, that occurred to me as soon as I read your question was, um, I recently listened to one. It was one of Brene Brown's um, podcasts, but it's with uh, Ibram X. Kendi, uh, who's the guy who wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist. Yes, book. yeah. And he had a really interesting point that has stayed with me. I mean, it, it, you'll recognize it. It's not brand new, but I, he said it so well and it is useful where he said that, you know, when you're in a group, right, and you're looking at the other group, you know, mm -hmm. um, we tend to look at individual negative behaviors in the other group and then generalize to the whole, to say the whole group is like that. Right. You know? mm -hmm. um, whereas we tend to look at individual positive traits in our own group and we generalize to the whole group and say the whole group is like that. So I thought, you know, and it happens in different directions and across and everything, but it's particularly powerful for a majority group toward a minority group because yeah. they then have the power to use that. Um, yeah against the, the group that is being somehow discriminated against. So I thought it was interesting to just sort of test our assumptions about these, these generalizations we're making about individual negative or positive traits. It is. I loved that podcast. I listened to it as well. In fact, I listened to it a couple of times because he had so many good little nuggets in there. Uh, another one that I, that I really liked was just the basic concept that to, to be an anti-racist actually requires action back to that <laughs> sitting on the sidelines That's just and in your saying head. to <laughs> yourself well i'm not an anti-racist yeah isn't enough yeah so i think yeah. that concept and wrestling with it you know individually in terms of plugging in and action back to kind of the overall point for gvv was really interesting so well mary this has been wonderful Thank so you so much for being with us today. I appreciate it. And you just have a wealth of information and <laughs> knowledge to share. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fun. All right.